Hello, everyone, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I'd like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Today's webinar is part one of a two-part series being presented by Rob Klinger with the Western Ecological Research Center for USGS. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Carter, Senior Scientist at the USGS National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Western Virginia. Sean, would you please introduce our speaker? Sure, thank you, Ashley. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rob Klinger today. He's a population and a community ecologist with the USGS at the Yosemite Field Station and has a strong interest in animal-plant interactions and eminent emergent properties that come from those interactions. He's been an ecologist with USGS since 1996, and prior to that, he worked for both non-governmental organizations and governmental organizations, uh, both uh, in the States and also internationally, primarily in Central and South America. So without further ado, uh, take it away, Rob. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks for attending, everybody. Before I jump into the, the meat of this talk, I think it's very appropriate that I acknowledge and thank the many people and agencies that have been able to keep this, this project going. Uh, first, of course, is the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Uh, if it wasn't for the financial support that they've given us, uh, this project never would have been able to continue. But beyond just their financial support, what I've really appreciated with NCCWSC is that my perspective is that they're taking the long view on these climate and wildlife interactions. And I think that that's going to bear a tremendous amount of fruit in various ways for various species and communities down the line. And so it's been very refreshing uh, to, to work with a group that has that, that longer view. A lot of people have contributed uh, ideas and data, and you're going to see a number of these names kind of emerge uh, strategically uh, during this, this talk. And just as we couldn't have gotten anything done uh, without the, the support of the NCCWSC, we couldn't have gotten anything done in the field without uh, the crew out of, out of Bishop that I've been really privileged to work with over the last last six, six years or so. Really, you couldn't have asked for a better, better group of people who went through a heck of a lot uh, to collect a lot of the data that you're, you're going to be seeing in this presentation. So thank you to everybody who's, who's been involved. Where I'm going with this talk is we live in a very, very, very uh, climocentric world, if you will. We know darn good and well that our climate has changed and it is continuing to change, uh, will continue to change. But one of the things that has struck me that in this particular environment, um, it's almost as if 50 or 60 years of ecology seems to have been subsumed under this, this mantle of, of climatic shifts. And just because the climate is shifting does not mean that ecology is going to just stop cold in its tracks. Uh, the big thing is that species patterns and processes are variable, and they respond in different ways to different types of, of forces. And that's why we have to think beyond just thermometers and rain gauges and packages of often coarse data that fit neatly into these, these GIS layers. There's going to be some real functional consequences uh, to ecosystems if there are truly major reductions in abundance or major uh, rain shifts in some of these high elevation species. And that's really what we're trying to emphasize in this. The modeling and forecasting that we're going to do are usually better when there's a better understanding of the ecological context in which we're doing that modeling and forecasting. And that context just wasn't there uh, for the Alpine Zone of this year. And I would argue it's still not there, that we have a ways to go yet. What I'm going to be doing with this talk is I'm going to spend a good deal of time, probably the first third of it, really nailing down the conceptual foundation of the study. And then I'll move into the data on the mammals, their abundance and habitat association patterns, uh, meadow composite community composition, and some of the temporal patterns we're seeing in meadow production, 
and then these plant-animal interaction experiments that we're doing, some real interesting results with some interesting implications that are coming out of those. And then I'll try and tie things together and give a little bit of a preview on part two. Now, what do I mean by part one and part two of, of the presentation? Well, I'm going to kick that off with one of our closest collaborators, Dirk Van Buren, out of UC Davis. And at the very get-go of the project, uh, Dirk gave us some very good advice. Dirk's been working on high elevation squirrels for a long, long time. And he said, you know, we just don't know what's going on up there. So we better start with the basics. And that's what this talk is about. It's about the basics. I'm going to be focusing on contemporary ecological patterns for these species and one of their critical habitat types. You're going to hear me talk a lot about scale, a lot about interactions, and getting at this notion of feedbacks between climate and ecological processes. Part two of the talk, which I anticipate being about a year and a half, maybe a little bit more than that down the road, will be the modeling and the forecasting. And while I'm going to be throwing a lot of data at you, I'm going to be leaving out a lot of the weedy, real technical stuff. Um, if that can come up either in the Q&A or probably better yet, uh, give me a phone call, shoot me an email. My contact information will be at the end of the presentation. We are working in uh, the Sierra Nevada and White Mountain ranges, and there are a few interesting differences between them, but it's been a more limited effort in the White Mountains. So I'm going to be focusing on the patterns which are qualitatively this, similar between the, the ranges on the Sierra Nevada. We're also looking at uh, five species, one large mammal and four smaller ones, and what I'm going to be emphasizing today are the patterns for the four smaller species. This project was born out of um, interest, need, and a little bit of frustration on my part. Uh, Eric Beaver was doing some very nice work with pika in the Intermountain West and was showing that they were having, uh, there was good evidence of uh, local extirpations uh, contracting ranges. But, and Eric, I think, would be the first to, to acknowledge this, that these results were being extrapolated to other ranges and other species, and it was getting pretty frustrating. Uh, there wasn't a lot of data to support this beyond, beyond what Eric was doing. And I was on the phone one day with uh, Matt Brooks, and I was voicing my frustrations, to put it mildly. And I said, Matt, it's like everybody is thrown up their hands and there's this foregone conclusion that these mammals are going to just be disappearing off these mountaintops in this rapturous ascent to heaven. And so Matt just kind of laughed and he goes, well, there's your hypothesis, Rob. So Matt and I, in a fairly tongue-in-cheek way, coined this term of the rapture hypothesis. And with apologies to a really great former rock and roll band, R.E.M., I think you know what, what the scenario is. The planet heats up and the mammals get trapped at the top and they start singing these great rock and roll anthems of, of doom and gloom. But that may not necessarily be the case for all of them. Um, and if you think of this uh, in terms of first principles of ecology and just using the part of science that is a body of knowledge, you have to step back and say, well, how likely is this scenario? The species differ in a lot of ways. The environment varies tremendously. So does that speak for these consistent, uniform, predictable responses or much more variable ones? So to us, the issues were, yes, climate is changing. It's likely going to be unprecedented in recent times. But we are not blind. Uh, what this figure shows is a well-known reconstruction of climate in um, North, the Northern Hemisphere over the last 2,000 years. There was a recent publication uh, this spring that's pushed it back farther. But what it shows is that there's been large fluctuations in temperature extremes for millennia. And that means that species and ecosystems in the Sierra have continuously responded to these large cl climatic fluctuations. So. The, the questions to us have been, how have vegetation communities responded? How have the animals persisted? And really important, how have the animals and the vegetation interacted through what is a, clearly not an equilibrium system if you look over ecological and even evolutionary timescales? So setting the stage for all this, 
In terms of the data that was available, there's a pretty fair amount on physical processes in, in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, but it wasn't always or isn't always that straightforward. We certainly know that temperature has increased. That pattern is consistent. But the pattern for precipitation is a little bit more uh, complex. It takes some effort to wade, wade through the data and try and figure out what's going on. Well, we should have been so fortunate uh, to have such, such frustrations with the biotic parts. There is very, very little ecological data on animals or plants in the Sierra Nevada. I would say that Connie Millard and collaborator Bob Westfall were the only ones that really were consistently and had been consistently working in that zone. Everything else had been kind of spotty, short term, very localized. And so we saw this um, as an opportunity to do good science and collect some information that was badly needed in that zone. And that uh, is really the impetus that kicked off what we hope will be a long term study. We're into the sixth year of it. As I mentioned, it's a multi-species study. The large mammal is the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep, uh, which is a federally endangered subspecies. And then the four smaller species that we're working on are the yellow-bellied marmot, American pika, and buildings and golden mantle ground squirrel. You're going to be hearing me talk a lot about scale today. And we've designed the project to look at things such as distribution, abundance, habitat associations, uh, we're not at the demographic stage yet, but we're, we're moving that direction. But we want to look at these at different scales. And that's going to allow us to do explanatory models of resource selection, predictive models of species distributions, all leading towards this notion of persistence. What is the likelihood of persistence among these species within and across mountain ranges and along environmental gradients? An area of particular focus for us are these high elevation, herbaceous dominated plant communities. Uh, broadly, I'm going to be using the term meadows for these. Uh, it depends on where you draw your line, but these have disproportionate importance to animals, not just mammals, but animals in general in these high elevation zones. Uh, relative to their total area. They make up somewhere between 8 and 14 percent of the high elevation area this year in Nevada. And the, the concern has been is that higher temperatures are going to increase the likelihood of drying in these meadows, uh, reduction in productivity rates, overall biomass production, potentially making them more susceptible to colonization by conifers and other woody species. And if these herbaceous dominated communities transition to woody dominated communities, this would represent a, likely represent a real loss of important high elevation habitat for many species. The flip side of this, though, something that often gets overlooked, is that higher temperatures could increase productivity, uh, either through longer growing seasons, higher photosynthetic rates. And what this could mean is increased competition for these woody species to contend with, making it harder for them to establish, harder for these transitions to occur. This is what I call my late night television slide. Uh, but wait, there's more. And there is more. It's not just competition. It's interactions between animals and plants. Animals do modify, oftentimes, uh, the, the environment that they live in. Many examples of this, many parts of the world. Functionally, in the high elevation zone, these mammals likely play extremely important roles as herbivores and granivores. And we have a lot of data from here and Europe indicating that, that is so. And so that led us to pose the question, and this is where the functional aspect of the study comes in, is could the mammals decouple what would be a potentially climate-driven transition of these meadows to forest patches through herbivory and granivory? So putting this in kind of a simple cartoonish, but with a little bit of animation sense, um, you see, I call this the typical boring old climate uh, scenario. Rising temperatures, rising ranges in woody species from lower elevations results in these transitions of the meadows to these stable, woody-dominated communities. Our alternative to that is a little bit more of a complex world, that there's going to be alternative states and alternative pathways to get to these states that result 
either from the individual or more likely the interactive effects of biotic processes and abiotic factors. So that's the conceptual foundation of the, of the project. So how are we getting at this? Okay, I'm going to probably have to do a quick shift on this slide so you can see the arrows. They weren't translating well. But we're using remote sensing data to look at change in land cover and condition, essentially meadow condition and meadow boundaries over a 40-year period. We're doing some good old-fashioned muddy your boot biology and collecting lots of data um, from line transect and point count and habitat samples on mammal density, their ranges, their distribution, occupancy, habitat association patterns. And to complement the observational data, we're doing um, these field experiments looking at the plant-animal interactions. Okay, here comes a little bit of shift, and then it'll go back to full screen. And there are all the arrows. Everything's back. Okay, so the data from the remote sensing and the field surveys are flowing into different types of mammal distribution models, which we're going to be comparing. And then the data from the remote sensing and the field surveys, as well as the output from the mammal distribution models, is flowing into projected meadow conversion models. Some of these models are going to be what you often see pretty typically in the literature, ones that are unadjusted. They're being driven by abiotic factors, but we're using the data from the field experiments to come up with ways of adjusting these transition for these biotic interactions. A little bit more specifically on the remote sensing data that I'm going to be emphasizing in this presentation, I need to give a real uh, shout out to uh, a climate layer uh, that was developed as part of this project by Otto Alvarez and his major professor, Xinhua Guo, at UC Merced. I don't have the time to go into the details of this other than to say that Otto avoided a lot of the pitfalls that um, plague downscaling efforts. He basically started from scratch, and he did it in a real thoughtful, thorough way, um, uh, testing different types of covariates to increase the effectiveness of the interpolation, especially for the precipitation layers, and did an enormous amount of quality control of the data. This has actually been so successful that they're taking this global now. In terms of measuring changes in meadow condition, we relied on uh, some normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI, which is a way of measuring productivity, or in our case, production. This was generated by Carl Ritker, who was then at uh, uh, UC Santa Barbara and is now at the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in Pasadena, and coordinated by Tom Stevenson, one of our collaborators on the, the project who heads up the Sierra Nevada Bighorn Sheep uh, Project. And Carl developed this layer for 4,700 uh, meadows throughout the Sierra Nevada. We're using data on 3,500 of those. These are bimonthly values going from April uh, through October from 1990 to 2010 at the 30-meter resolution. Very powerful, uh, large data set. In terms of the uh, field survey data, the core of it were our line transects. And these things here that look like intestinal parasites are the locations of the transects. We have 21 of them uh, throughout the Sierra Nevada. This is very extensive sampling. It spans about three degrees of latitude, captures about 90 to 95% of the alpine zone of the Sierra, spans an elevation gradient of about 4,500 feet. These transects are 10, 10 kilometers long. Uh, they've been sampled from 2008 to 2012, three to four times a year. They were selected from a pool of a little over 60 potential routes, and each transect has 10 point count stations uh, that are randomly located along it. And we also have done an equal amount of extensive and intensive uh, habitat sampling, too, vegetation sampling, if you will. Over 250 plots have been sampled between 2010 and 2012. And as with the mammal surveys, uh, this is intensive data as well as extensive. 
And then the field experiment, I'll get into the details of the design a little further on in the talk, towards the end of the talk, uh, but basically this is your classic exclosure study where we've done seeding as well as seedling planted plantings uh, inside and outside of, of uh, exclosure, so essentially manipulating granivory as well as seed density, and then me measuring various factors and looking at uh, seed germination and survival of seedlings inside and outside those exclosures. Now I've been talking about scale, and I'm going to continue to talk about scale, so I need to, I need to define that a little bit more explicitly. When I talk about the range-wide scale, we're talking about the mean value of some var variable across our study area. When I talk about the regional scale, that's based on the transect on the order of 10 square kilometers. That's based on the linear distance of the transect, 10 kilometers, and a one kilometer belt on either side of that transect. At that scale, we have almost 10,000 observations that we've collected over the five years of the study. When I talk about local scale, now we're at the hectare scale. 20 hectares, 250 meter uh, radius around each of our point count stations. We've collected a little over 5,000 observations at that scale. Then the patch scale, which are the geo-referenced locations of the animals that we observe in the field. Uh, it's about a half hectare scale. We've got about 8,700 observations at the patch scale. All right, so let's get into the data now. If we were to see consistent responses among the species, there are five conditions, five general conditions we would expect to see met. The environmental variability would likely have to be low. We would see some pronounced structuring ge geographically in their distributions. Also some correlation, spatial and temporal, in their abundance patterns, both for species and assemblages. And when I'm talking about an assemblage in this, in this presentation, talking about the combination of species, so species identity and their relative abundances in a, at a particular scale. And then the species would need to be restricted in habitat breadth and have similar habitat use patterns. So let's start working through these systematically, starting with the environmental variability. We have three general data sets, three classes of data that we're using for these environmental uh, analyses, these relationships. We have a climatic data set, we have a land cover data set and a topographic data set. So what we did, after looking at some correlations and paring down the variables, at look, at, look at these environmental conditions here at the regional scale. So each of these points represents the environmental conditions for multiple variables for a transect. Principal components analysis, quite good one, explained almost 70% of the total variation on the first three axes. And the things that jumped out of here was you don't see real pronounced clustering. As a matter of fact, you see a lot of scatter throughout environmental space. In other words, the environment is extremely variable. The gradients that we're picking up are not simple ones. They're very complex. You have multiple variables from each of those variable sets defining those gradients. And interestingly enough, climate accounts for less variability overall in topography and vegetation. So you have this very highly di or this highly variable environment of which climate is not necessarily driving the bulk of that variability. Shifting over now into mammal abundance. Mm -hmm. Start off with a real simple diagram for each of the four species over time. At the range-wide scale, this is their density, the number of individuals per square kilometer. And I show this mainly just to show a very simple pattern. Because if you parse down, if you go down to the next scale and look at what's going on regionally, so it's, we're still at the number of animals per square kilometer, you get a lot more dynamic view of what's happening with, with the abundance patterns for these for these species. And we see the same thing at the local scale. A nice, neat, clean, range-wide estimate, density per hectare, animals per hectare, that is obscuring some very strong dynamics at the local scale. And this is one of the things that really jumped out at us. 
is that these large-scale patterns, here I've simply transformed the data's uh, the interannual rate of change. These large-scale patterns are masking these incredibly strong spatial and temporal dynamics. And it's not just in magnitude, it's in direction as well. So that between any two years, you can see increases going on, you can see decreases going on, you can see stability. So it's magnitude and direction. A lot of people would be tempted to write this off at noise, but we're saying, well, wait a minute, this might actually be the ecologically relevant pattern. This is what we need to be paying attention to. In terms of the geographic structure, here we've got the structure for each of the four species. Here's latitude, here's longitude, this is their density, and this is their variation in density. Now, if we saw strong geographic structuring, you would expect clustering of points for different levels of density or variation in density in different geographic regions. But what it looks like is more of a shotgun pattern. And we see that as well at the more local scale. And we can test this statistically using some spatial statistics. We can actually quantify how much structure there is. We have four species. We have five years of data on each of these species. And what we were looking for, if there was supposed to be some kind of consistent response, is positive correlation of abundance with geographic distance, and that would be over a long geographic distance. But what we see instead is this statistic, Moran's eye ranges between minus one and one, is all of the correlations were negative. They were all less than zero. And this held at both regional and local scales. It's a little bit more of a complex uh, pattern for the assemblage. But we can again look at the composition and relative abundance of those assemblages with geographic distance using a Mantell statistic. And this gives the correlation in species identities and relative abundances over geographic distance. And what we see are two positive correlations, one about one kilometer away from each other, another about 18 kilometers away. We also see two negative correlations between 8 and 12 kilometers away, and there's absolutely no correlation as you get farther away from 20 kilometers. What this is saying is, that the assemblages are similar within about a kilometer of each other, and then maybe a watershed away that has similar environmental conditions. But also, there can be a lot of dissimilarity between those assemblages within a few tens of kilometers of each other. But this is the big one. The correlations, be they positive or negative, are all occurring within essentially 12 miles of each other, not beyond that. The message here is that there is minimal geographic pattern in density or the variation in the density. The correlations in their abundance patterns are inconsistent and they're certainly not very extensive. And a lot of this is probably being due to these highly variable spatial patterns that we're seeing in abundance and the temporal patterns. So now let's look at some of the habitat associations. We're going to start among the species. And we're going to look again at three scales, regional, local, and patch. We have abundance by transect data. We have abundance by point data. And then we have the incidence, presence, absence, at georeference location for which we've got vegetation data for. Again, our three general environmental data sets. And our goal is to find the most parsimonious set combination from these, the intersets. Uh, variables that explain the most variation in distribution abundance patterns. Starting at the regional scale, each of these points represents a transect in a particular year, the species composition, the relative abundances in that year. And the first thing that you notice is you see a lot of these mixings of transects and years in environmental space. You don't get any discrete clustering either spatially or temporally in this. For the most part, you see separation of species in environmental space, although the marmot and the pika are fairly closely associated with each other at the regional scale. Now keep that in mind. 
the species are aligned with different environmental gradients, and in this parsimonious set of variables, only one climate variable was retained. The rest came out of the land cover and topographic data sets. Going down to the local scale, again, we see a real mixing of the points in environmental space. The species continue to be separated for the most part in environmental space, but now notice at this scale, the associations have changed. The marmot in the building's ground squirrel are more associated at this, at this scale than they were at the regional scale, and the marmot and the pika are quite separated at the scale where they were more closely related at the regional scale. And again, the species are lining up on different environmental gradients. And the climate variables fell completely out of this set at this scale. Going down to the patch scale, now we see complete separation of the species in environmental space. And of course, they continue to be re related to different environmental gradients. And again, only one climatic variable was retained out of that set of the original 21. Now let's shift over a little bit and see how, what their habitat use patterns are and how selective they are. Starting off with use, we're going to have two indices of habitat selection that we're, we're looking at. The first one, which is abbreviated, its symbol is B sub I, is an index of relative habitat selection. It scales between zero and one. The closer to one, the higher selection for a particular type. We have half a dozen general land cover classes. And what you see, not so much because of selection, of course we expect this, but each of the species, each of the four species, is using several different of these land cover classes. So that indicates that yes, they have their preferences, no surprise there, but they're not necessarily that restricted in their habitat breadth. Now let's shift over to the absolute index of habitat selection. If the 95% confidence intervals for this index overlap one, that means that they're using this particular class pretty much in relation, in relation in proportion to its availability on the landscape. If it's above, that means they're selecting for it. It's used just proportionally more than its current. Below the line, that means that they're selecting against. And what we're seeing, I'm using the marmot and the golden mantle ground squirrel as examples here, is that there are these interannual shifts in the magnitude of selection. Even in habitats that are clearly favored, land cover classes that are clearly favored by these, you see these shifts in magnitude. And sometimes, for some of these classes with all four species, you would see disproportionately more use in one year, disproportionately less use in another year, and then proportional use in another. So the notion, notion here, the message is that they are not that stable in the magnitude of selection over time. We can ask, well, do we see the same thing spatially? So using the Belding's ground squirrel and the pika as examples, what you see is from transect to transect to transect, again, shifts spatially in the magnitude of selection to the point, for example, here with the Belding's ground squirrel, along some transects they use shrub-dominated areas pretty much in proportion to their availability. In other areas, they avoid them, but in others, they're found disproportionately more in the occurrence of shrub on the landscape. And we see these patterns for all four species. What seems to be going on, I'm using the marmot as an example of this, but again, it holds for all four species, as that the proportion of different habitat types shifts from geographic area to geographic area, they can adjust their selection behavior. Now, I'm just showing two positive uh, relationships. Not all of the relationships are positive. Some are actually negative. But habitat selection does seem to be varying with availability. They're shifting their behavior. So now we can revisit these five conditions. Is the environmental variability low? No, it's quite variable. The species aren't very structured at all in their geographic distributions. They're very patchy distributions. 
and there's very inconsistent, low and, office in, in the, low and often in the opposite direction of what is expected in the correlation, the geographic correlation of abundance. The species don't seem that restricted in habitat breadth. They are, for the most part, facultative specialists. Use varies temporally, and they can shift the selectivity among regions. And they certainly are different in their habitat use patterns, and that can also vary with scale. Now let's shift over and look at the meadow structure and condition, this important habitat. What I haven't mentioned up to now is this look at their habitat associations. Out of those half a dozen general land cover type of classes, meadows were the only ones that all four species used at least in proportion to its availability on the landscape. Uh, a number of them, especially the marmot and pika, consistently used it more than its availability on, on the landscape. Needless to say, this is a very important habitat type as we suspected, as we knew anecdotally for these species. So it would be useful to know what is driving species composition in these meadows so we can incorporate that kind of information into the modeling and the forecasting that we're doing. This is something that Jen Chase in our office here in Bishop has been leading. She and I have been working on it. And we've taken a meta-community approach. And we're looking for evidence of the four processes that are typically considered to be what maintains meta-communities. And what we expected were very strong species sorting along environmental gradients. In other words, a lot of turnover in species composition along gradients that we figured would be related to the climatic variables. We also expected some um, dispersal effects. So again, we had our environmental gradient data. We had the geographic distance among all pairs of plots. We had 160 meadow plots that we were using in the analysis. And we did two types of multivariate analyses, and I won't plague you with their very long names. But these are very um, efficient uh, analyses because it lets you look simultaneously at turnover along gradients and what the effect of dispersal is on composition. And boy, did we have some surprises coming. First of all, Looking at an index in similarity in species composition, this is a presence absence one, Sorensen and similarity index scales between zero and one. Uh, it's the same for other indices of similarity as well. Is that even when environmental distances were very close, very similar environmental conditions, you had very, very dissimilar species composition. Each one of these points represents the pairwise comparison among all of those 160 meadow plots. And we saw that geographically as well. So that a plot that was a, a pair of plots that were a couple hundred meters apart from each other could be as dissimilar in species composition on average as if they were 20 kilometers apart. We expected about half of the variation in plant species uh, composition in these meadows to be explained by environmental gradients, but only about 10% was. An equally low amount of that variation was being explained by these dispersal effects. There was a lot of residual variation. Where we expected to compare the species abundance distributions to this neutral model, the null model, just to show how different it was, this is where the biggest surprise came is that the pattern was consistent with expectations from neutral processes. If you looked at the observed and the expected distribution of, of species, either by frequency of species in different um, occurrence classes or as a cumulative probability, they were very, very, very similar. This is indicating that local conditions and what are known as priority effects, essentially who gets there first, is really responsible for a lot of the meadow composition. So that leads to the question is, if communities have assembled locally in these meadows, would we expect them to not reassemble the same way if there were changes? It's an open question. Then, of course, we want to know, well, how about the condition of these meadows? Are they getting less production? And this is where the NDVI data came in. The first thing we wanted to do is make sure that NDVI was actually tracking herbaceous biomass. And we did a simple regression on that, and we were very relieved to find that it was. So this is the data for the herbaceous biomass data from our vegetation plots. 
against different measures of NDVI, and we got these very strong correlations. We also wanted to make sure that these GIS layers that were saying that uh, a, a particular class was dominated by herbaceous vegetation really was, and so we did some confusion matrices of what we saw in the field, what the GIS said, and we're, again, relieved to see that, yes, our assumptions are being met. These are being mapped pretty accurately. So what is that temporal pattern? We can look at the minimum NDVI, the mean NDVI, and the maximum mean NDVI per meadow per year. This is using generalized additive models, which are a very effective way of looking at variation in time series data. We also had an interesting statistic that we calculated, the coefficient of variation of NDVI. That's a measure of the spatial heterogeneity within these meadows. And if they were drying, we expected that, that coefficient of variation to be large and to increase. And what we saw instead, instead was that it was very small. There was very little heterogeneity within these meadows with the NDVI data. And for all four measures, what we saw was a heck of a lot of variability, but not much trend. What trend we did see was with minimum NDVI, and that was not indicative of drying. It was actually appeared to be increasing. Another way of looking at that is simply to convert these values into interannual rates of change. And what we saw is them fluctuating in a highly variable fashion around one. So pulling this together, production in meadows over the last 20 years has been highly variable, but there's no evidence right now that we can detect of a decreasing trend. For the animals, what this implies is, in terms of potential forage amount available to them, it's been pretty stable. It might even be improving in some ways. And now we'll get to the field experiments. Uh, we had the assistance of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of mosquitoes to set this experiment up, of which, of course, we were eternally grateful for their help. Uh, we got this set up in August 2011. And what this consists of, two sites, one in Yosemite National Park and the other in Kings Canyon National Park. And at each site, we have three arrays. And what the arrays consist of are these combinations of seeded or unseeded within an exclosure or outside of an exclosure and five different seed densities. We also jumped to the next life history stage and, and planted 84 seedlings. So now we're able to look at germination rates and seedling survival inside and outside of these exclosures. And what we find is quite striking. In the first year after the initial seeding, this is within exclosures, this is outside of exclosures, is we see three to five times as much germination within the exclosures that are protected from herbivory or granivory as we see in the outside. Each of these lines represents one of those different uh, seed densities, and there is density dependence, at least within the exclosures. But the real story is across densities, you see higher levels of germination. Now, typically, it's been said, oh, I've heard this over and over again. What matters for germination of woody species in these meadows is soil moisture. Yes, that's true, but they have to get past the mammals first. There is a soil moisture effect. There's also a competition effect, which I'm not going to get into. And we can jump to the seedling life history stage, and we see the exact same thing. In the first four months after uh, planting the seedlings, there was 88% mortality, and that went to 100% uh, a year afterwards outside the exclosure, where there was only 2.5% mortality within the exclosures. Pictures here of a Belding's ground squirrel and a marmot, each uh, either in the process or after chowing down on some seedlings. We said, okay, this is interesting, that's great. That's experimental data, that's from, from two sites essentially. Is there evidence that this could be going on at a larger scale? So what we did is a distance decay analysis, looking at the distance from the closest colonizing source, a patch of crumb holes, a patch of conifers, if you will. And what we would expect 
if, this, if herbivory and granivory weren't important, is that these reverse J-shaped curves for all three life history classes. But that's not what we see. What we see is low or no numbers of, of seedlings and no decay of the counts over distance. That is implying that distance matters, but so does granivory and herbivory. What we're seeing is a little bit of a disconnect over time. Is that a seed and then a seedling escapes predation and they accumulate typically close to the colonizing source over time. But the seedlings themselves, probably the seeds and the seedlings, are getting hit very hard, close and far away. Jen Chase and I are calling this the gauntlet hypothesis, or putting it in the vernacular, anthropomorphizing a conifer, asking, what the heck have I got to do to get established in these alpine meadows? Now, Stephen Asoyas likened this to a sieve. It's an ec ecological filter. First, you got to get there. That's dispersing from a colonizing source. The second, probably biggest hit, is that you can't get munched by a marmot, pika, or ground squirrel. The third hit is you can't dry out, and the fourth hit is you can't get beaten up by those herbaceous neighborhood bullies. So it is tough to get established in these meadows, in the, at least in the alpine zone. So let's start pulling this together now. Some early interpretations. As I said earlier, we're very, very interested in what others consider noise. The mean response is probably much less informative and mean, meaningful that's what's going on at regional and local and possibly even patch-based scales. And we need to integrate this type of data, this type of information, into the dynamics of the models and the forecasts that we're developing. The mammals don't appear to simply be waiting around to be victims. They can adjust their habitat use, and there is this evidence. They are managing their habitat, if you will, through herbivory and granivory. This to us does not speak very strongly to the likelihood of uniform responses throughout the alpine zone. There's a heck of a lot of heterogeneity already in the environmental conditions, mammal distribution and abundance, and their key habitat type. This is implying to us that we might better expect areas of a high, low probability of persistence. But there are some caveats and some implications that go along with these interpretations. One is that simply we have not re reached a climatic state yet where we're seeing large changes. These transitions could also be very rapid, this notion of thresholds and tipping points rather than a more clinal gradual change. And the patterns that we're seeing in the alpine zone, in the uh, very upper part of the subalpine zone, probably does not hold in, in other elevation zones. Uh, Caitlin Lebutkin, who is a PhD candidate at UC Merced, is doing some very nice experimental and observational work in the subalpine zone, and she's getting very different patterns than we are, but those patterns start falling apart as she pushes up towards tree line, and our patterns start falling apart as we push towards tree line. We're gonna start working together on this to get a little bit more clarity on how far we can extrapolate results from these different zones. Change is happening, yes, but change is not necessarily synonymous with disaster. But if there are wholesale shifts from what we're seeing in our data, that has some very profound fun functional implications for what is gonna go on in the vegetation communities in the alpine zone. Right now, what we think is happening is that these little windows of opportunity during years when mammal or a year or a series of years when mammal abundance is low, that conifers could potentially get established in the meadows. If there's drastic changes in abundance, if there are big changes in range, those windows of opportunity might open up to a full door. We plan on continuing our field experiments and we're gonna be doing a lot more analysis of the ecological patterns. One of the things we're particularly interested in is comparing models with GIS data with data that is not typically suited for GIS and see which is more informative. And of course, we're gonna continue working on changes in meadow structure and function. With the modeling, one of the things that we plan on doing is making sure that each of our models 
also has an uncertainty layer with this. Otto and Xing Watt, UC Merced, and I have talked about ways of doing this, way of spatially partitioning, temporally partitioning, and spatiotemporally partitioning the data to get at this notion of how to generate uncertainty layers, quantify just how good these models are that we're building. We're doing the same type of things with predictive RSS, resource selection functions. We have a very, very nice example of that that Alex Few, who's working with the Bighorn team, um, Tom Stevenson's team, is doing with models being developed for the Bighorn sheep. And then the modeling of the meadow dynamics, which as I said before, is going to be really tricky. It's going to take some time and some thought to do, do a good job on that. So are the alpine mammals doomed? Is Jacob's Ladder going to descend out of the skies? And is there going to be a wholesale rush of these hairy, high elevation creatures getting away from these hot temperatures and heading to a cooler but better, better place? Or are they going to be singing a little bit different tune, adding some, some lyrics to R.E.M.'s song of doom and gloom that, yeah, it's the end of the world as we know it in some places, but there's trade-offs and some things are going to happen in some ways in some places and in other ways in other places. And with that, that's my contact information, and I think that we're now open for a Q&A session. Ashley, is that right? Yes. Thank you very much, Rob. Great presentation. Thank you. And we are now open for questions. All right. Our first one will be from Tony Lynn Morelli. Hi, Rob. <laughs> Lynn, how are you? Um, I'm doing great. Um, good talk. Really exciting to see, and it's just incredible how many different aspects you've taken on with this research, and it's really awesome. And looking forward to the years in the future too. I have a question. I'm thinking about you talking about the species you're looking at being facultative specialists. So mm -hmm. one thing that strikes me is perhaps seasonally they are, but most. I guess probably all four that you're thinking of, that you're you are looking at and talking about today, have very important habitat requirements in the winter. And so some of the work that we've been doing or thinking about um, focuses on the impact of warming in terms of snowpack and how um, the hibernators might be starving to death during the winter and early spring. You can imagine pika also have um, important habitat uh, requirements in winter. So is that something you're thinking about? Yeah, it is. And when we're developing the models, um, it's probably going to be fairly parallel with some of the work that you've been doing, is that issue of uh, the insulating properties of the snowpack. But we also want to incorporate uh, the potential nutritional aspect uh, in, in those types of models. And that's because, yeah, they might lose some insulating properties, but they might make it up in terms of increased forage availability. But, yes, it's definitely something that we're thinking of, um, and it's, it's something that we hope to be incorporating into those models when we develop them. Cool. Thanks. Looking forward to the more results coming out. Be patient. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question from Eric Bieber. Excellent job. I echo Tony Lynn's uh, comments. Um, it was neat that you included a lot of different aspects. My um, question is about scale. And could you maybe talk to, particularly relative to the habitat associations and the resolutions at which we should think about those at the various kind of scales of analysis, particularly down at the lower scales. Um, can you talk about how those are meaningful in terms of what um, distances these animals move and how you how you calculated those those associations in terms of how fine they were? Okay, I I think I see where you're going with this. In other words, how did we come up with say a 10 square kilometer and a, a 20 hectare scale? Correct. Okay. 
So what those were based on um, were the distribute the sighting distributions of the animals along the transect and at the point counts. And we got into the literature, and particularly with the, with the marmot, they can have some pretty long uh, dispersal distances. And so it seemed like, uh, based, based on uh, the, 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 distrib the sighting distributions for these species, that these were the most meaningful distances that we could come up with. Now, that being said, what we're going to be doing with the modeling, and this is where that patch base, and I think where you're going with your question, is really going to be important, is we have these, exact, these precise geo-reference location. And around each location, we're going to be developing models based at different distances for species. So where pica is more limited to, you know, its home range is probably on the scale of a few hectares, maybe a, a couple, you know, might have tens of hectares, although I doubt that whereas a marmot might have a much larger home range, we're going to look and see what the different predictions are as we vary that scale from those patch-based locations. Mm, great. Excellent. Really quickly, too, did you see the same kinds of patterns in terms of most of the variants went to residual or unexplained variants if you used a different index of similarity? We used... Um, Sorensen's? Yeah, we use we we did Sorensen's jacquard and Morosita horn, and of course Morosita horn takes into account the relative abundance, whereas jacquard and uh, uh, Sorensen's is just based on presence absence. And absolutely yes, we, huh. we saw that same rapid drop off both environmentally and geographically and similarity. Excellent, thanks. Great work. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we have another question from Chris Hoban. Hi, Rob. Um, my question has to do with uh, what you, um, if you had put any thinking towards uh, carbon dioxide fertilization and the effects that might have on productivity in these meadows. That's a really good question, Chris. And yeah, we have thought about it, but we haven't gone down that route yet, and we doubt that we're going to for now. Um, we've got enough on our hands with the data that, co that we've collected that we want to we want to get a handle on that. Then in the future, if we can start getting into those kinds of questions, yeah, you know, nitrogen deposition is another one that we've we've been thinking about. So we've so we've kind of broken our our modeling uh, scenarios into first generation, second generation, and third generation. And we see those kinds of questions probably being third generation questions for the modeling. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. And do we have any more questions out there? All right, Rob, did you have any closing remarks? No, I think I've talked enough today. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank you again for a great presentation.